Boom. Seamless. That's, <laughs> that's a professional operation right there, everybody. That's good for a Monday. Pretty good. Pretty good. We're ready to go. I was telling Lisa <laughs> I like got down a little later than I normally do because I was um, swapping out the batteries in an RC car for our seven-year-old. So, nope, for a five-year-old. Our seven-year-old's still in bed for our five-year-old. So, okay. My delay. Anyway, so glad that you guys are joining us. If this is your very first time joining us, we uh, really consider it an honor to be able to begin the day with you and um, really for us to be able to spend daily time with God and hopefully uh, together to be able to build some new rhythms of that, even in times like these where it feels like maybe um, there's just not a lot that we can control in our own rhythm, in our own routines. And one of the things I believe that we can institute that's really healthy and helpful is just spending this daily time with God. And so we began a new series this weekend at Eastern Hills called Who Needs Church? And we were in Ephesians 2. Uh, if you were with us last week, you already studied Ephesians 1. And so you're ready for it. Um, and then we will kind of hop over, but reference back to that section um, but in these notes, which this is a new notes page because we're in a new chapter um, and I don't want to scroll 40 pages down to get to where we are by the end of this book. Uh, <laughs> this is linked in the description of today. You can go grab it. Um, and then if you look at the top, uh, there's a link to the message from this weekend. If you want to go like get my take on Ephesians 2 from a weekend. But we will begin in Ephesians 2 verse 11 here in just a few minutes. But we want to say some good morning to some folks. First of all, good morning to you, Lisa. Good to good see morning. you. Good morning. In case you forgot Lisa's name. Here it is there right it is. there. There it Boom. is. So we fancy. Uh, good morning, Debbie. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Good morning, Shannon. Good to see you. Good morning, Kathy. She went hiking on Saturday. It was. That's awesome. That's It was beautiful. Uh, good morning, Linda. Good morning, Crystal. Uh, that's Guten Morgen. I, was like, I don't know what that is. That's a different language. Got it. Good, good, <laughs> good Mor Morgan to you too. Uh, good morning, Fred. Good to see you. Good morning, Becky. Uh, I'm so grateful for the weather we had this weekend. Bonus, I found my preferred brand of toilet paper and a cool puzzle at the same store. I feel like I won the lottery. Saying that to yourself six months ago. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, good morning, Aaron E., uh, we had uh, family movie time Saturday night. We did that last night, and it was a dumpster fire. So I'm glad that it was the best part of your weekend. What did you watch? Uh, it was like the live action Lion King. We oh. do it every Sunday night. We watch a movie, but last night the kids were just over it. Over it. So good morning, Arlene. Good to see you. Crystal said jackpot. Good morning, Derek. Glad you could take a break from fishing to hang out with us this morning. <laughs> it's good. Good morning, Shauna. Good morning, Sherry. Good morning, Jeanette. 
Good morning, Dawn. Winning mini cornhole tourney with family. Strong. Nice. Good work. Good morning. Enjoyed the sun this weekend and guacamole from a visiting food truck in the neighborhood. That sounds delightful. I don't even like guacamole. So good morning. Love the weather this weekend to get out uh, for walks. Also, some friends and I watched a TV show together and video chatted during it. Yeah, that's become a, a thing, right? Good morning, Vicky. My favorite thing is that my son has been teaching himself to make baked goods. Perfect timing. Yes. He even bought himself an apron from Debbie. That's amazing. If he keeps <laughs> this up, I will be finding ways to ground him so he keeps baking. Uh, good morning, Leslie. Uh, good morning to you, JC. Thanks for being here. Uh, good morning, Samantha. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning, Lisa. So it was so nice to get outside and get all the flower beds cleaned, lawn mowed, garbage cleaned. Oh, man, that's a great weekend. Great, good, great job. Stacy. good morning. Mary Pat, good morning. Alberta, good morning. Went bike riding with my family. That's good. exciting. Dominic, happy Monday. Guten Morgen. I don't oh, even know how to say that word, so that's great. German, uh, you need to brush up on your German. I do. Yeah, yeah. If you guys would just let me know the language to review before each day, that'd be great. Uh, met a new neighbor this weekend. His name is Pat, and he needs prayer. All right, we'll pray for Pat. Uh, good morning. Uh, Earl Jennifer says, doesn't like guac. I know. I'm a picky eater, so it's it's a thing. Uh, and then, Leslie, good morning to you. Good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for saying good morning. Uh, we really, truly hope that this is um, not just Lisa and I kind of talking uh, for a while, but a chance for us to talk together. And so as you have uh, questions or observations or even comments, you can go into this document and add those. You can also comment in the feed and we'll kind of tackle that a little bit as well. Uh, David said, good morning. Got some time to clean out and organize the garage. That's exciting. And Debbie, this feels like a personal attack. So <laughs> hurtful. There it is. I heard someone describe guacamole like cat throw up which was concerning to me on so many levels, but yeah. Like how did they know? I, well, he had a cat and I guess that's what it looked like. So he couldn't get over it, but Gross. I'm what over was your it. Favorite part of this weekend. Um, well, this weekend was a little funny because the like super highlight of the weekend was I turned in my paper on time for school. Like that was a huge bonus, Trump. but Trump. we started watching a new show with my family called Antarctica. It's on okay. Disney Plus, but it's through, is it National Geographic or whatever the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so intense. Did you ever watch Ice Road Truckers? It's kind of like that level of intensity where you just feel like they're always going to fall through the ice. Always. Strong. Or freeze yeah, to death. That so, sounds stressful. Catherine can't handle it. It's, it's too much for her. Yeah. <laughs> but we're almost done. All right. Well, you know, it's good. like a second level of torture for her. Good. Good. Yeah. Well... You know. you know, parent win. Yeah. Therapy okay. jar. Feels good. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, just a reminder to you guys, this link right here in the notes is um, a kid's study of this same content of Ephesians. So if you want to study it with your kids or you just want to check it out for you, that link is there. If you miss any of the daily time with God sessions, we now have a YouTube page. You can go to that, which is linked in the description and look at any of the previous ones. Like if you're just joining us this week for Ephesians 2 and you missed Ephesians 1, you can go back and watch that or our Philippian study or Holy Week or help at home content. So I think that's yeah, it. Yeah. And I think hey, I got Christine, all this covered. yes, this is recorded. That's what Phil was just talking about. So you can find it right here on Facebook or you can go to the YouTube channel right. uh, and you can find it there. Yep. It's in YouTube, which is linked in the description of this post. There we go. Yep. And Crystal said those those National Geo shows. So good. So good. Said watch Lost Cities on Disney Plus. Awesome series. Good to know. Good yep. to know. Yep. Is it just guac? I have a recipe for you. Uh, I, are you saying I don't trust you right now, Derek? I feel like this, I'm getting trolled. So, <laughs> all right, Lisa, before uh, more people make fun of me for my picky eating habits, you want to pray for us? Yep. Uh, God, thank you so much for uh, Monday morning. Um, thank you that we can be together. And God, that we are able to um, study your word even when we are far apart. Uh, thank you for this description of who the church is, not just what it is. Uh, God, I pray that you would help us to understand um, the words that Paul wrote. And I just pray that you would help us to uh, live these out in our lives. 
Uh, we love you, and we just thank you so much for sending Jesus to us um, so that we could be with you. Amen. Amen. So uh, if you were with us um, as we studied Ephesians 1, we talked a little bit about the context and the circumstances of writing. Um, and so if you missed that, you can go back to it last week. There's a document just like this for Ephesians 1. And in it, we talked about Ephesus being a pretty big city, a city where Paul had helped to plant this church. Uh, had done ministry there for a couple years um, and now is writing to a church that he assumes different faces, all that stuff. Um, but he's so thankful that they've continued to learn, continued to grow. And he's trying to help them understand the foundational truths of what it means to follow God in a place where Artemis Temple, this Greek God, uh, was the most prominent uh, point of worship. And so because of that, there was this merging of this new uh, tradition in following Jesus with these old traditions. And so um, Paul is addressing that um, in Ephesians 1, his kind of big core message, right, is that you and I um, actually are uh, a result of this bigger plan from God that everything in our life and in our reality, God is in control of. And there's a mystery to his purpose and to his plan. Man, totally non-controversial words at all, like predestination and election got used a little bit, but those words don't show up at all today. So uh, that's good. Um, and then in Ephesians 2, we looked at it this weekend. Um, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, like this problem that a lot of people have, I would say, uh, with Christianity uh, is that it's it's a crutch. And so I talked about the fact that it's it's actually way worse than that because um, I don't need a crutch, right? Somebody with a limb needs a crutch. Uh, we're dead um, and, and we were actually made alive in Jesus. So the cross was not a crutch. The cross was, you know, heart paddles to, to bring us back to life. Um, and so we talked about that and the mercy that Paul talked about even last week from that um, and this new reality of being made uh, alive together in Jesus. And then um, he finishes in verse 10 with this idea that we're his workmanship and that we were created uh, in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So all that is the context mm -hmm. to where we'll find ourselves in verse 11. So Lisa, if you wouldn't mind, would you read verses 11 through 16 for us? Yes, sir. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at, the, at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Awesome. All right. So as I mentioned, you know, the the picture of what it means for us to like kind of step into this <clears throat> is this increasing humility, this increasing appreciation and understanding um, of who we were before Jesus and the means by which we have hope and salvation in Jesus literally have nothing to do with us. Like we, we could not be further from the reason, right? Philippians or Ephesians 1, 8 through 10 was where we finished this weekend. Uh, it's by grace that we've been saved through faith, not as a result of our works so that no one could boast, right? The whole reason that this is the way that it is, is so that nobody can say I'm good enough, strong enough, smart enough. So we've, we've titled, highlighted that a little bit, but anything else you want to mention here as he talks about therefore and kind of builds on what he's focused on through this first chapter and 10 verses so far, Lisa? Uh, well, I think it's, I kind of separated this um, first section of two into past, present, and pride. Um, and so this idea of who you were, who you are, and why you are. And then mm -hmm. that, like you said, that we had nothing to do with it. And so we kind of need to remove ourselves from that equation because this is what God um, has done for us. Uh, through Christ. Absolutely. And I think the the great news is that um, 
you didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You couldn't pay it back even if you tried to. And so all those people in your life, all those circumstances that you're thinking about right now, um, that's true for those people too, you know? And so the same supernatural power that it took for you to know God, that's the same thing that it's going to take for them, which in some ways may be discouraging because you're like, well, I really wanted to be able to do some stuff to win them over and you can love them and care for them and tell them about hope. But ultimately it's going to be beyond you. Like it's going to be God that gets the credit for doing that. So you can't boast. So they can't boast so that God gets all the credit because that's where it belongs yeah. in the first place. Um, and then he, he mentions this word Gentiles that may be, and he even uses the phrase, interestingly, Gentiles in the flesh. Um, and he, he ties it to this term uncircumcision. Tell us about the term Gentiles for somebody that's never heard that before, or yeah, maybe so heard it, but didn't get, de didn't, know, didn't yeah. get defined. Um, so really what, what's, what's happening kind of in this, in this world that Paul's living in right now is there, there are two kinds of people. There are the Jewish people who would have been considered the chosen people of God. And then there was everybody else and everybody else was a Gentile. Uh, and so th this is, this is who Paul is talking to is mostly a Gentile community. Uh, so people who hadn't been considered, um, Jewish, so they weren't considered part of God's people. Awesome. And, and I would say we're going to see, um, we're going to see three categories of barriers that especially for the Jewish people separated Jews and non-Jews, Jews and Gentiles. One of those was social. And so mm -hmm. we're going to see Paul allude to that a little bit. One of that is even civil because for the Jewish people, um, they had specific civil rules, commands, um, things that function for them as a people, and then spiritual barriers. And so recognizing that Paul at times is talking about all three of those things together, and at times he's kind of pulling one of them out on purpose, right? And then he references them, he calls them the uncircumcision. Um, you know, usually when I'm teaching this in our mixed room, I'll be like, all right, kids, ask your parents, you know, um, <laughs> but it's obviously uh, this practice that still happens today for some. And, um, you know, it's this thing that was done to remove the foreskin of a, a, a baby boy eight days uh, after he was born on the eighth day. And so uh, that was a normal sign. It was kind of this way for Paul to be able to say, hey, this is a specific requirement of the law. One of the things that I think is so interesting about it, right, is that it's, it parallels a little bit um, inside of Judaism, this same idea that just like within biblical Christianity, you didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it, you couldn't do it. If you were a Jewish man, you, you didn't have a say in whether or not you had gotten <laughs> circumcised. Somebody else made that decision for you uh, before you would have, I'm sure as an eight day old, you would have probably voted against it, you know. Um, and so, that though becomes this uh, th this term called metonymy that he uses this idea of circumcision often as a distinction uh, between being inside of the covenant relationship with God for Israel and being outside of it. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts about kind of as we see the end of verse eleven and verse twelve there referencing th this kind of marker for Paul? Yeah. Well, one of the things that Paul's really um, passionate about and it, you, you'll see this in, in a lot of his letters when he's talking about circumcision and uncircumcision, but he's really making this point that that is something that's been done to your flesh. And um, it's a, it's an outward thing that is showing people um, this separation between who was God's people and who wasn't, but that it really had nothing to do with their, their heart or the posture of their um, heart toward God. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we see quite often a, a challenge within um, uh, kind of the history and the, the tradition of Judaism, where it's very easy for the things that they're doing to be primarily external. The goal was that those things would be symbolic, that they would be reflective of something that would happen internally. Uh, but over time, that became more and more distorted, um, certainly at the time of Jesus' ministry, where oftentimes the frustration that he has was that they were doing the external act that was required, but they had disconnected it from heart obedience, which was the entire point. Right. Uh, and then he says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Now you here, who's he talking about? The Gentiles. Right. So, you know, we see Paul playing this game a little bit um, 
throughout Ephesians already, where sometimes he's identifying with his audience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he's identifying with the Jewish people. We, sometimes he's identifying them differently. You, sometimes he's identifying them differently. They, and so you're like, it's like a pronoun game with Paul uh, throughout the entire letter. And he's doing it on purpose. Right. Paul and brilliant. then we'll see him say us. Right. And so mm -hmm. it's distinguishing yep. all of those pronouns before helps us then identify when he's saying us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jeanette said, I often equate the belonging to Christianity as having similarities to being a citizen of a country or a nation. For a new believer, initially, they are learning a new language and a new culture, and in some ways, unlearning the old culture, similar with joining Christian faith. Sometimes you see more lingering old culture in first generation Christians like myself. Well, and, and I would say, too, uh, I think that's a fair comparison in the sense that we are described as ambassadors with a new citizenship. I think what's hard is sometimes instead of thinking about our citizenship in heaven and what it really means to follow Jesus, we've created this subculture of like weird Christianity. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, Hey, there is a new language, but it's not from the Bible. It's just like weird stuff that we say and have decided at some point we should say, um, and that's actually not what we should do. And so how do you, how do you figure out from the old, what is actually not working to help you grow closer to God? And how do you figure out the right new to lean into? And then uh, Crystal said, love this note from her study or from her Bible. It says, in order to realize how great the gift of salvation is, we need to remember our former natural unclean condition. Christ's love overcomes feelings of alienation and brings outsiders into the body of believers. Absolutely. And Paul was talking about that here, right? He's talking at one time about the social and spiritual barrier that had existed before. And he's saying in Christ, that is no longer mm -hmm. a challenge, right? So here he says, we were separated from Christ. That's the spiritual, um, that's the spiritual barrier, uh, like we've already talked about. And then he goes on and he says, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel's of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise. So commonwealth of Israel, that's social barrier, strangers to the covenants of promise, that is civil barrier, right? So we see we see all three of these layers throughout Paul's distinctions here. Yeah. Um, and then it says, having no hope, uh, he's describing their situation before Jesus, having no hope mm -hmm. and without God in the world. Now, uh, something that I take hits on sometimes is I'll talk about this. I'll talk about how, how people without Jesus have no hope. And sometimes people that don't follow God, they'll be like, well, I have hope, you know? And so it feels like an interesting call out when people would maybe say, hey, I have hope. Um, I, I would say we need food, oxygen, shelter, and hope. I think it's an absolute their minimum of existence. So why do you think Paul uses this language of them having no hope before Jesus? For me, I think it really is just kind of um, emphasizing what he goes on to say without God. Um, so we can have hope without Jesus, but our hope is in ourselves or it's in somebody else. And the, the reality is, we just can't live up to people's expectations and what they're actually hoping for. And we can't even live up to our own, um, which is why we oftentimes are blaming something else like our, our circumstances and our situations or other people. And so what I've always um, kind of found Paul to be saying here is this having no hope is, is emphasizing that because you're without God, um, they, they go hand in hand. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think, you know, that there's this phrase I've said sometimes that uh, hope always comes with a rope, you know, and it's pulling us somewhere. And I think that Paul is saying uh, when you and I place our hope in something that isn't Jesus, it's not really even hope. Like it's it's pulling us down. It's pulling us backwards. It's pulling us off course. And it's temporary. And so the idea of like, what is the rope that you want connected to your hope? Where is it pulling you? And when you place your hope in Christ, you have a rope that's pulling you towards heaven, right? Mm -hmm. And the decisions that you make today and in the future reality of God for eternity, right? So um, I agree with that, that, that this idea of like, you're having to live without God, period. Uh, that, is a, that is a brutal place to be. Uh, and then he says in verse 13, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, now before we move on, where have we seen this same construction? He says, but now uh, there is, a, this is, this is a nerd alert, but it's too fast to put the thing up. This is what's called an adversative conjunction. It's the word in Greek, a lot. It's a very strong word. It doesn't come in the position that we read it. It comes later, but we move it forward. Um, but we saw a very similar verse to this 
just a handful of verses above. Do you remember where this same construction shows up? Well, I'm hoping that you're talking about verse four, but God. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yep. And I circled them both because they, you know, they do go together. It's this idea of uh, we were and now we are. Um, and, and it wasn't us. It was God. And I think there's this understanding um, that there is uh, a intervention that is required in our standing and status with God. That if God had not intervened, we do not have the hope he's just referenced. All these other things are true of us, but God, but now, but him. Mm -hmm. It's not you. It's not me. It's not because we've done anything that should deserve it. It's not because we've earned it. It's because of him. And so it said, but now in Christ Jesus, you were you who were once far off. Right. Again, here we see him with this kind of personal pronoun. He's talking about Gentile readers again. Right. He's saying you guys, you didn't have access to this before, but you have access to it now. Uh, you who are once off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, um, this is quite common for lots of us that study the Bible a lot, but blood of Christ, why is that the reference he's making right here? Yeah, so he's talking about um, Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And so it was through um, Christ's blood, which was in in most cultures of this time, um, to be right with whomever your God was, there needed to be a blood sacrifice. And so this would have been familiar language as far as using blood um, for both Gentiles and Jewish people. Um, but there's just this idea that it was Jesus's blood that was um, sacrificed to make us right with God. And I think, you know, something to understand for the Jewish people, their sacrifices were ceremonial, very specific, um, you know, uh, specific animals done in a specific way. Uh, for around Artemis and the temple and, you know, kind of the Greek God structure, you saw some of the most heinous, despicable. I mean, this is, this is in the era of world history where it wouldn't have been unheard of to be thinking about like child sacrifices, you know? And so the idea of this once and for all perfect sacrifice on your and my behalf, that the blood of Jesus himself, yep. God's son, Jesus would bleed so that the once and for all sacrifice could get made, not just for his people, but for all people to be grafted in that contrast for them hits way harder than it does for us today, because Thankfully, we do not sacrifice things. Right. So, yeah. Um, and then he says, for he himself is our peace. Talk about that idea a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, again, this is something that, that Paul talks about, um, very passionate about. And it, it, there are two things I think that that he is trying to draw together here. The first is just this piece that that we can't manufacture. Um, we've talked about that, that this is a piece that can come only from God. Um, and it is this inner, um, I don't know, inner quietness, inner stillness um, that, that is not dependent on our circumstances. But I think he's also talking about this piece between um, the two different people. So the, the, the peace that um, we need between the Jewish people and the Gentiles, again, that wasn't going to happen naturally. And so it was through Jesus that now, um, and he's going to build on this idea too, this idea of unity uh, and peace. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just like we've been talking about the spiritual, social, and civil, right? This peace brings peace to all three of those areas when it's manifest the right way. And, um, you know, the, the word that most notably, you know, it's hard because for Paul, he grew up studying the scriptures because for him, the scriptures were the Hebrew scriptures. It was the Old Testament for us. He grew up studying that in Hebrew. And now he's writing these letters in Greek because that's what people would be able to read around him. And so it, it's hard because sometimes you have to read behind the Greek word to what was the Hebrew word in his mind he was trying to tap into? What was the concept he really wanted to work on? Um, and I, I included some commentary reference here. I think the word that he was really thinking about uh, is the word shalom. Mm -hmm. And it's this, um, not just the idea of peace in a general sense, but that God would be a peacemaker, that he would do what was necessary to create the right rhythm and rule of life and eternity that puts us back into right connection with God. And so this idea of, of peace and shalom for everybody in our world, right? We're all trying to figure out what does it look like to find purpose, to find peace, to find comfort. And here Paul is saying like, Jesus is actually the embodiment 
of that rhythm, of that shalom, of that peace, whether we realize it or not. Um, and then he says, who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now, uh, he, uh, we're going back to personal pronouns here. When he says, uh, who has made us both one, he, you, made, you made this reference already. Here he's talking about us. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this picture of being grafted in, this picture of divine adoption, right? And has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Why do you think he uses that phrase dividing wall? Well, I did a little research on this. Nice. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I found is that there was actually, and you, we've talked about this also, there was this um, outer court of the temple where um, non-Jewish people were allowed to be. And then there was an inner court where, where those um, non-Jewish people could not go. And what I read is that there was actually um, an inscription on the wall that basically said, if you are not Jewish and you go past here, um, like your blood is on your own hands. Like you, you made it, you made a bad call um, by going in there. And um, so, I mean, that was obviously a hostile warning uh, that, that you did not belong um, in there. So I thought that was really interesting. And then I think there was just this hostility that was um, very present between the two people and for a Jewish person and Paul was Jewish um, by birth he did not hang out with, with people that were not Jewish because that would make him unclean. He would no longer be able to um, do kind of the rituals and ceremonies that he needed to do until he had washed and made himself clean. And so um, I, there was just this, this nastiness kind of between the two. Um, there was resentment both ways. And so I think, I think it's maybe a both and. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Jeanette says, uh, is the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles or between us and God? Classic pastor answer. Yes. <laughs> you know, like uh, th th there there were all these indicators that this was not just civil, not just social. Right. Uh, this was actually spiritual. Right. So for the Jewish people, they had this thing called the Mishnah. Uh, which really identified oral tradition was called the fence or sometimes would be called the wall around the law. Um, and what it was, was if it was like, hey, here are, you know, a handful of things that you should do or not do around the Sabbath. Well, we want to make sure that this day of rest, this day of restoring order, we want to make sure that that's not messed up. So instead of just a few of them, let's add dozens more so that you don't even get close to this center area, right? So there's this picture that the Jewish people had in mind. And then uh, Paul, in, in writing to the churches in the Glacier region, in a letter he wrote in the New Testament, he uh, refers to the law as this guardian or this tutor whose purpose was to show us the gap. Like the purpose was not that you and I would figure out how to follow it and therefore achieve righteousness on our own because that's not possible. That's the entire point of Galatians, actually. Um, he talks about how it was literally to show us our need for something greater and to show us our own inability to do it on our own. Like that is the actual point of the law. So did it separate people socially and civilly? Absolutely. Did it also separate people spiritually? A thousand percent. Um, and so one of the most controversial ways that we translate the book of Ephesians is found in verse 15. So he's talking about this dividing wall of hostility. And then it says, "By a, Jesus did this by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. That is a bold statement, right? Especially when we think about where Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. We're like, Paul, I don't know if you like heard from Jesus on this one. But he actually, like he sort of, he sort of talked about it already, right? So how do you kind of reconcile what Paul is saying with what Jesus said, Lisa? Uh, well, one of the, one of the translations that I've liked, um, it, it, it uses the phrase rendered it useless, the law. Uh, and, and I like that because it's not that, and, and your comment said this too, that abolish is a pretty strong word. Um, but it's not necessarily that it was abolished. Like you said, um, that's not what even Jesus said, but that it, it's not the way that we're going to uh, be whole with God. It's not the way that, that we're going to be able to get to God. The, the, the law can't do that for us. Um, and there were thousands of years of Jewish people that proved that the law wasn't going to work. Well, and Paul would even say in the book of Romans, he would say that 
even if you're not a Jewish person who's aware of the laws in the Old Testament, we all have laws, right? Like we have ways, even if you're not a Christian, we have ways that are like, oh, this is the way that I'm going to be a good person. Right. These are the standards that I hold myself to. And Paul's whole deal is like, you don't even follow your own. Like you, we're so bad. Like we're right. so messed up at our core that even our self-made rules and regulations, we don't comply with, right? So obviously it can't be through works of the law, either God's law or our own, because we aren't capable of following those. And that does nothing of the fact that we were dead in our sin before we were ever alive here in flesh. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like it's this bigger picture, um, but I agree there's this there's this picture um, that, that I think translations, I understand why it's translated this way from the word that's here, but I think the word nullify or rendered it useless, or uh, there's some, some language I think in some of the um, uh, commentary work that I, dropped in there, right? Uh, it's no longer operative. He's used up the law. It's been discharged of its power. Like, I think all of those point to what Jesus ultimately did, that the purpose of the law has served its purpose. Um, and what's hard about that is that there are some really, really challenging aspects for us, um, especially if you've been a Christian for a while, because we instantly take a step back and go, okay, so if I don't have to follow rules and laws, then why do I do anything? Right. Like, and, and Paul, that's really the entire point of Galatians. And so maybe we'll study that one in a future time, but that's, that's his entire point is, Hey, did you like who, who tricked you? Mm -hmm. Actually, I think the word he uses in um, Galatians three is who bewitched you, right. uh, who has, who has influenced you to believe that what started by grace through faith is now fulfilled by works. Like that's just not possible. Um, and so what does it look like? We we've said this phrase sometimes um, that Jesus institutes this new law, the law of love. Um, and that when you're not sure what to say or do, you do what love requires of you. And it doesn't mean there are principles or ideas found within the law, uh, but it means that that law is not something we do to get to God. It means that in following God, because he got to us, we look for those places in our character, in our life to reflect who he is back. Yep. yep. Have I said any heresy in there yet? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not yet. Okay. You guys let me know in the comments. <laughs> I, th I think Jeanette is telling us that if you're interested in, oh, there we go. Mine says uh, he made of no, of no effect the law. Yeah. Yeah. Same kind of deal from the yep. Christian standard. Yep. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, and then he goes on and says that he might create in himself one new man in the place of the two. What's he talking about right there? So essentially he's saying um, Jesus came and and he has uh, broken down this wall between Jew, Jew and Gentile. And now we are one. Uh, it's this idea of unity. Um, now we are one other places he'll he'll say one body um but here he's saying one new man we're one new almost like one new creation um right. in the place of of what was two and it is this foreshadowing a little bit of what he's going to talk about in the church right of of unity and oneness um but i think there is this picture that paul had unique authority to make this statement Paul was not saying mm -hmm. this as somebody that had grown up as a Gentile. Jesus had picked him. He became a follower of Jesus. And now he's like, hey, Jews, we're all in this together. He was somebody that had unique authority that when he made this statement, he was like, I know what it feels like to have the birthright, guys. And I'm telling you that what this guy Jesus has done is he's removed the power of the birthright because we're all grafted in to this new and better agreement with God where it's no longer about trying to maintain connection by our obedience. His perfect obedience obedience has given us inseparable eternal connection, right? Yeah. And in Philippians, he even talks about his past as almost like rubbish. Like that means nothing to me anymore. Um, it, it's what I stood on. It was essentially the cross that I bore at that time. But now that I know Jesus, it doesn't matter. It's nothing to me because Jesus is everything. Absolutely. And I think for them, right, they're talking about Jews and Gentiles. But Paul has constantly been talking about this before and after thing, right? And so for you, yep. there may be a different before than Judaism um, of what it meant for you to depend on God. For some of you, we've already heard about, right? For you, your past was Rome Catholicism. And maybe for you, there was some pretty heavy guilt I've heard <laughs> laid on to you about what it is you had to do and how it is you had to like kind of make amends or how it is you had to do specific things in order to kind of work that off, right? And you're facing maybe for the first time, this picture painted by Paul of 
that no, 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 what, what it means to truly know and follow Jesus is 100% by grace through faith. Yeah. It's not as a result of your works. And there's a reason. Yeah. It's so that you can't boast. And Jesus did all that to actually make peace, not just make civil peace, not just make social peace, yeah. but to make spiritual peace that you and I could find shalom in yeah. God in a way that the Old Testament and in a way that the sacrificial system of Judaism was actually never designed to do. It was a setup to all eventually point to this Messiah, to Jesus doing it for everyone. Yeah. And we've talked a lot about how kind of the, the Jewish side of this, but going back to what we talked about this weekend, and, and if you if you haven't read those first 10 verses, um, go back and read those because he Paul's really going to... Um, kind of push the pedal on the Gentiles here. And he's saying, you can't work your way to Jesus. It right. doesn't work that way. And so it, I know that's how you worked your way toward Artemis. I know that's how you worked your way toward whatever your family God was, but that's not how we, how it works with Jesus. And so um, he's kind of bringing it all together here from, from the Jewish perspective and, and then that Gentile perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Dom said level playing field for all who follow Jesus. What a gift. And yeah, I mean, the, the I've heard it said this way, right? The ground at the foot of the cross is level. Like it doesn't matter who you are, or what you've done. We're all at the foot of the cross, begging for mercy and grace, needing mercy and grace. There is no way apart from that, that we will find hope. Uh, certainly not the hope of heaven that right. endured the challenges of this world. And then he finishes, he says, uh, might reconcile us both to God and in one body. Again, this is this uh, kind of foreshadowing of the church mm -hmm. uh, conversation that we're going to have uh, over the next little while inside of Ephesians uh, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And I think there's this juxtaposition we see Paul making between hostility, war, conflict, and shalom and peace, that God is making all those things new and bringing peace and bringing people together. Which is crazy, right? Because when you, unfortunately, when we think about church, not just today, but when we think about church historically, there are plenty of times where it feels like the church has injected hostility rather than injected peace, has avoided the fight of a culture rather than stepping into it with mercy and mm -hmm. grace and shalom and figuring out, like, if that's what Jesus did for all of humanity, how do we do that in the midst of controversial moments that we find ourselves in? It's good. All right. Well, as you guys are thinking about this, this passage, we're going to start talking about application. Would love for you to just answer a simple question, right? What is it that you are thinking about? How are you considering applying these verses into your day, into your week, into your life? So Lisa, once you get us started, what you yeah. got? Uh, when I read this, one of the things that always stands out to me is uh, who are them? When I think of us versus them, um, who are the thems in my life? Because what Paul is saying is there is no them. It's just us. And yet we still kind of live our lives with that us versus them mentality. And mm -hmm. so what does it look like in my life to allow God access to that wall of hostility? And how can we... Um, how can I be kind of a bringer of peace, a peacemaker, like you talked about? And I think, you know, that's a super important thing right now, uh, because I think there are so many conversations, so many issues that are stirring up anxiety, that are stirring up conflict. Um, you know, there's there's a phrase even in Proverbs, a, a repeated phrase in the Hebrew that basically says, hey, who are the people in your life that are just basically looking to stir up a fight? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, way too often we can slip into that same place of like we're just looking to stir up a fight uh, when there's something so much better than that available. Uh, Crystal, I think, just commented. She said, uh, here, um, here am I injecting peace, in, or how am I injecting peace instead of hostility into my conversations and relationships today? Absolutely. I think that's, that's a great thought. Let's see here. Can I put that in there like that? Sure can't. Can I put it in there like that? Yup. There we go. There you go. You know, computers. <laughs> no in crystal, so I'll take that out. Um, and then you're getting a shout out from Jeanette. Said hey. Jeanette, uh, Jeanette said, Lisa, that is brilliant. Who are the thems in my life? So the wall can be broken down. Yeah, absolutely. 
Jesus came to break down the wall between Jews and Gentiles. He came to break down the wall between us and them today. Yeah, for sure. And, and Phil, you you say this a lot in your messages, but you talk about um, those people that are not like us and don't like us. Uh, maybe that's where we start. Are th are those your thems? Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure I stole that from Andy Stanley. So yeah, I'm pretty sure oh. you did too. But I was gonna, I was just gonna let you handle that. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really good. It probably wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I think that we oftentimes, and, and I think I've talked about this, we create these eco chambers where we just don't even have people allowed into our world that disagree with us. Yeah. And so we'll, you, you'll see it today, probably on Facebook scrolling, somebody will say something and then the end of it, it'll be like, don't like it, unfriend me. And you're like, that mm -hmm. just feels like not the way Jesus would handle this, you know? He he had the phrase I think that Andy uses. He said, "People that didn't like him and were nothing like him liked him," and uh, that is that is a powerful marker of candor and kindness. Um, and we're going to talk about that actually in a couple months yep. as, as a church. But I think um, how we figure out how to be candor, how to be candid, have good candor, and be kind with people in the midst of disagreement is at the very heart of the gospel. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts, ma'am, as you reflect on this passage? I don't think so. Anything okay. you've got? I think as I continue to reflect on Ephesians 2 as a whole, um, not in sort of like a fatalistic way, uh, but I would say, am I remembering today the lengths to which Jesus went to win me back and the state I was in before him. Uh, I think that it is just this slow drift in following God uh, where it is so easy to at some point think like, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't fully earn it, but like I had, I had something to do with it, you know? And uh, I think that is so dangerous uh, when we let ourselves get there. And so just, just taking time to process and remember Okay, this is this is what Jesus did. The reason that Jesus did what he had to do was because of what I had done, was because of the gap between where I was and where he was. So, yeah. Well, hey, uh, this has been a great conversation. As always, we are going to be continuing to kind of work through these verses over the course of this week, every day at 8 a.m., uh, would love to have you join us. Want to continue to plug for Aurora. If you need help, know somebody who needs help or would like to help. Uh, we really want to make sure that our community knows uh, who we are and what we're about. Um, and we want them to know that we are for them. And so that means um, through Debbie and her teams, we're, we're serving a whole lot of folks, giving out hundreds of meals a week, giving out boxes of supplies to people in need. Thank you. Thank you for those of you who are donating. Thank you for those of you who are showing up, masks on, gloved on, socially distanced, contact us, contactless delivery to cars, uh, hands and feet of Jesus in a time where people really, really need it. Um, the prayer requests get harder and harder. And um, we want to make sure that we are uh, being thoughtful in the way that we care for other people. Um, Dom just said, he said, may we be God's excellent ambassadors today. Absolutely. That is very good. Um, so, hey, I want to pray for us before we go. I am looking right now. We are going to pray for Pat, Jeanette's neighbor, as we do. Let's pray together. Uh, God, thanks for today. Thanks for this conversation um, uh, of a chance to, for each of us to remember what you've done, the place that we've been, the work that you've done, and the new peace that we can have in you today. I pray that you would pour that peace into our lives. Maybe for somebody today, you're going to pour it into their life for the very first time because they're going to cross the line of faith and to decide to turn from the direction they're on and believe in you who you are, receive the gift of salvation that you've made available through your sacrifice and begin a new life with you. We pray that that would even happen today. God, I pray for Jeanette's neighbor, Pat, that whatever the needs are there, that as she's met Pat, that you would uh, provide hope and healing, comfort, uh, whatever it is, God, to continue that relationship and help Pat today. Would you deliver that? And we pray for the crisis all around the world. 
Uh, we pray for doctors and uh, first responders that you would give them the PPE they need today, that you would help them to continue to not only battle coronavirus, but all the other aspects of their reality that have been made more complicated. Uh, we pray for government leaders who are making decisions, even in these days, about what it looks like to lift stay at home orders and to let people out of their house and all the things that are going to come, God, and the potential impact of that. And we pray for uh, researchers and scientists, God, that are working on vaccines right now, that are working on cures right now, that are figuring out what uh, drug treatments could work. God, we pray that you would give them your insight today. Would you help us, God, to be lights in our homes, in our neighborhoods, through our keyboards to friends and neighbors and coworkers today, that we would live as your ambassadors, that we have been saved by grace through faith, not because of what we've done, so that we can't boast, so that, God, we would just boast in you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a great day.